Great. Now, just a couple of days ago, uh, the lovely Matt Cardle came in. He's going to be, well, he is now in the West End. And um, just, it, we spoke to him uh, the morning after his first night. So the reviews haven't come out yet. The reviews have been great. Congratulations, Matt. So thrilled to have you here at last, Mr. Matt Cardle. Thank you for having me. It's well, so good to be back. Well, when you came on the lottery, you promised you'd come on the show. It's now taken about, what is it, 26 years? <laughs> yeah. I think it is about 26 years. Um, uh, how are you? I'm really good. You're I'm a, really good. You're a West End Wendy. I'll stop that. You are? Stop that. No, look, I mean, I, I feel very lucky to be to be doing what I'm doing at the moment. Um, it's still very fresh. Um, so we'll see how I feel in four months. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because you're now in Memphis, the mm -hmm. most incredible musical. Everybody I know who sees it says that they have to go again. It's one mm. of those shows. So for people who haven't been, tell us about it. Well, it's set in uh, Memphis. It's in, not, it is, is it? Believe right. it or not, it's set in Memphis in the 50s. Uh, segregation is uh, in full swing. Um, and uh, I played the role of a kind of bumbling wannabe DJ who loves the black music um, and is spending his time down on Beale Street and he shouldn't really. Um, and he falls in love with uh, Felicia Farrell, played by Beverly Knight. And um, they go on a journey together. He kind of embarks on this um, mission to make her famous, get the black music heard, make himself famous. It's not a totally selfless act. Um, and he succeeds largely. Um, what happens along the way is just hilarious and heartbreaking all at the same time. Um, and yet the pace of the show is just incredible how they keep the story going with the music. Um, at such a pace is, is quite something. That's why people say that they could see it again, is because it's it's kind of almost over before you know it. <laughs> you just want more of it. Do you know what I find so shocking, though? We're talking about something that happened, and it's such recent history, mm. that it was like that it's so recently. Uh, 50 years ago, and that's, that's nothing. Actually, it's even more recent than that, mm. you know, that people just weren't accepting a black singer who wanted to become a star. No, totally. Um, and, and the fact is, it's such a heavy, you know, such a heavy story running through it, uh, and a heavy message, sorry, um, and there are a few moments where that message really kind of stabs you in the heart and you're like, oh God, you know, that, yeah, that wasn't, there's mm. no joke in it, yet it manages to maintain hilarity with it. It's, it's incredible. Do you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to fade up Beverly singing. Oh, which, which number is this that we've got here? Ain't nothing but a kiss. I know. I've interviewed her so many times over the years, and I've known her for years. And that voice—it seems, if it's possible, to get better. Well, I, th I think it has. Um, you know, first time I heard it in um, auditions was just something else. I mean, I've <laughs> seen her sing live before, and she's blown me away, like she does anyone who sees her sing live. Um, but standing in a little room, going through a number, and she just opens her mouth and starts singing at me. I just was like, I just crumbled to a heap. No, but hold oh on, hold on. It's not like you can't sing, Mr. Matt. Beverly Knight has one of the best voices on the planet. But she has a fabulous voice. That but, is no joke. But so do you. You know, we all watched, uh, you know, let's, we have to. It seems ridiculous to have you here without saying, I never, I never really, when I was watching you and vote, my kids are here in the background, uh, when I was voting for you, and they'll say it's true, they'll know, yeah, wasn't I? Yeah, I was voting for him. Um, <laughs> that when we were all voting for you and cheering you on, that you were going to end up in a West End lead, you know, all that time, mm -hmm. then the things... Uh, that have happened to you it's mm -hmm. been quite an extraordinary well ups and downs I suppose hasn't it yeah totally I mean to get to this point I've gone through you know four albums nearly five tours you know rehabilitation and coming out the other side of it into a West End show it's it's been it's been amazing it's been a hell of a journey um and it's still going on you know there's still so much to do I've got the new albums out in October as soon as I finish the show I'm straight out the show into promoting that um so things so do you think of yourself then as a showman or sort of more like you're Robbie Williams and and Ollie Murs now are you are you sort of aiming yourself to go that way a showman as opposed to a pop star well, do you know what? I mean, I've heard people, you know, saying, you know, I've found now what I, you know, my niche or whatever, you know, 
as the way I'm looking at it is I've I'm in a West End show at the moment. You know, Will Young has done it. He's done albums. Yeah, he's, he's dipped out of it. He's done a show, cabaret. I think he's done another one. He's done more than one, more than two, I think. And you know, he he's just had an album out that had great success. You know, you can do both. You don't have to just do one or the other. Um, I've been handed the golden egg of shows here, working with Beverly every, every night, working in the best show in town, and in one of the best male roles there is around. Um, to have that, you know, sort of handed to me for for this period of time, I, you know, incredibly lucky. You then. weren't going to say no, were you? I was never going to say <laughs> no. I would have said no if I couldn't have done it, but, you know, once I was given the green light, I think I had to start believing in myself, you know? Do you now? Because you, you went through, I mean, I've interviewed you before, obviously, you know, recently, but also when you were in your trouble times, and um, you had no self-belief whatsoever. You had no confidence. No, uh, I didn't, and f for various reasons it had been ground down, you know. Um, and these things happen, you know. We're not made of stone. Um, we we have feelings, everybody does, and it's it's one of those things. Like you said, it's up and down, it's peaks and troughs, it's life, isn't it? You know, you never know what's around the corner. But I think for you, what's so incredible is because you were just that the lad that won with that great voice, and you did all your numbers, and you wore your vests and everything. You know, there's the whole <laughs> thing, and your guitar and your hat. Yeah. Um, that that when when everything became so public, I mean, how do you cope with that from being just a regular bloke you still are a regular bloke mm. I have to say I, look, I know you and you're fabulous you're just Thank regular you. but suddenly your private life is not private anymore mm. and the fact that you went into rehab and you had to you know that everybody knew about it mm. that must have been tough well <clears throat> do you know what it wasn't easy personally um I have you know I need to be careful how I say this I have no shame when it comes to little things, you know, if my trousers fell off in the street or whatever, I have no, I don't care. I don't have any. We'd shame. laugh. We'd, We'd all I, laugh. I would laugh. Yeah. I mean, not in a not very in nice way. way. No, yeah. no, no. Gabby, come my on. kids are here. Shush. <laughs> yes. No, we'd laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with, you know, what happened with the rehab thing, you know, that was I needed help and I sought help, you know, and that I have no shame in that, and no Good one should you. have any shame in that. Um. So it, yeah, it's just one of those things that happened, and um. You know, I, I can't say I'm proud of it. You know, I'm proud of the fact that I got through it. That's, you know, that's something I'm proud of. Do you feel different now than you did before? Yeah, totally, yeah. I don't drink. Way? I don't drink. I don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, after I'd come out, I, for, for you know, I felt like the inside of me was that of a 10-year-old boy. You know, it was clean wow. and clear and, you know, I could run and jump higher and everything. You know, it really, it really did turn my life around uh, with a lot of help from some amazing people. And how how have friends and family treated you since that? Because very interestingly, other people that I've spoken to who have done exactly the same as you and equally as famous and some who have been going for many, many, many years say that other people aren't sure how to treat them afterwards because they're used to having a drink with you or sharing, you know, whatever it is. They're suddenly yeah. like, oh, I don't know how to treat you. Well, I mean, I think that depends on the individual. I think it depends on the nature of why they sought help and what for exactly. I think um, if you're the kind of person who needs, you know, uh, um, something to, to get by socially, it, it can be awkward, you know, when you're out and about. I've never really needed anything, and it wasn't about a social thing for me. It was, it was much different. Um, but it's like, you know, you just got to be normal with people. The more you make it, you know, the more you bring it up, the worse things get. You know, a friend of mine's just lost his mum and, you oh, know, <clears throat> it's, it's, you know, I don't, I don't treat him any differently. And when I spoke to him, when, you know, when things were getting really bad, it's like, you know, ask how she is and, you know, crack on. Well, and I hope she's great. Well, look, give her my love. And anyway, what are you doing tomorrow? You know, you mm. can't tiptoe around people walking eggshells because then they're more aware of it and it's like you just got to be normal with people you don't see now that's the other thing is you don't walk on eggshells because you know you were very public about your hair i mean mm -hmm. i believe you filmed that well, you look, filmed having a hair transplant good for you well, i mean great well, and your hair is, looks great <laughs> bless you thank you well look i mean it's like i'm i'm only 32 it's like i didn't want to lose but you it, look so. about 21 now you'd have You've got you've aged backwards <laughs> since I've known you. It's very Bless weird. You. It's all that water. Well, yes, it is. It's, <laughs> it's nearly three liters of water a day, which I don't drink and don't do that because you can drown yourself. People don't do that. Um, <laughs> I was talking to my dresser and um, my dresser. Oh, yes, you oh, see, you are God. a Wendy. 
Wendy. Shh, I you knew you were going to. I knew you were going to jump on that. There. All right. I have one. I have to. The I changes know. are quick. I know. No, I was talking to Ali, and um, she said she was working with someone who got very stressed out one night and dehydrated and and drank themselves into hospital through water. It's a very famous story that one of a certain actor yes, on the is. West End, That's Anthony right. Andrews. That's it, Anthony Andrews. Yeah, and she was his dresser. Yeah, he d- uh, he did three liters of water or something, something apparently on the stage or something. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and then, then passed out. And passed out. Yeah, kids. By the way, that means you don't stop drinking water. No, you need to drink, drink plenty, water. but just not too much. You we can talking, drown yourself. Let's go back to the hair transplant. Yeah, yeah. Being so public. That was well, amazing. Look, I'm, again, like I've no shame. It's just like it's one of those things that happens. Look. What I will say is women get a certain surgery and lots of women get it and it's public and it's just cool. It's they fine. a boob job. Yeah. I was like, you got a oh, wicked hair. Oh, here's my new boobs. It's like, so why is a, a guy <laughs> getting new hair so all like, oh my God, you had a hair transplant. Oh my God. It's like, no, hold on a minute. You've just whacked a load of silicon in your chest and that's fine. You know, I've just moved some hair around my head. All right. Get over it. Right. Whatever. Oh, I Sorry. wish. No, I love I it. I quite angry then. No, but that's I mean good. It. It's, like, it's no taboo. People, you know, guys shouldn't be, uh, you know, afraid of it. It's, you well, know, it's, it's a it's confidence it's thing. It's a, you know, self-esteem thing, as is a boob job. No, but I was going to say to you, everyone's become, and I do, I bang on about this on the radio show for, for ages. I get very worried that everyone's so judgmental. And it's all, I, I choose not to have Botox. It's just something I choose not to do. Well, you look but, fantastic well, anyway. You but, you know, and, and my boobs are my own. But, the, but people choose to do all of these things, and it's about judging others. And that's what worries me. If it's for you, that's mm-hmm. a different thing. But when it's about, you know, oh, she's too fat, she's too thin, he's mm-hmm. too old, he's this, he's that. Oh, why did he do his hair? You know, why mm-hmm. can't we just let everybody do what they want to do yeah no exactly i mean we do live in a society where we are bombarded with images of semi-perfection but it's not really perfection it's perfection through adobe photoshop and perfection through you know literally annihilating yourself in the gym or putting silicon or you know moving hair around all this kind of stuff you know and it's it's not real life it's none of it's real life you know you go out into the amazon that's real life you know people aren't adjusting the way they look because they just literally couldn't give a flying what's it you know because it's not important but we live in an, in an age and a society where, unfortunately, for kids growing up, and even for me, like it, it does seem like an important thing, and it shouldn't be. Is that but what your tattoos are about? No, they're all about death. Oh! <laughs> no, they're not. They're not all about death. I, I mean, wasn't like, expecting you to say that. That no, threw they're, me. They're, they're tributes to people that I have had and have lost, you know, a lot oh, really? of... really? You know, my nan, my uncle. That's just some of it. You got it, so you've got one arm? Just the one, so I can go into a room that way. You can go in on your left side. Be very PC and be like, yeah, no, hey, I'd love to work at a bank. And then you go into the room. I'm stealing Mickey Fannigan's jokes now. That's not cool. (laughs) He won't mind. He won't mind. He will. (laughs) Maybe he will. Um, Okay, so remind everybody when they can see you, where they can see you, and about the fabulousness of of Memphis. Well, Memphis is just off the scale fabulous, even if I say so myself (laughs) being in it. Um, Come see it, it's a must see. We are at the Shaftesbury Theatre. Um, in London's West End till the 31st of October. Book tickets at memphisthemusical.com. You did all of that without reading it? I've done it a couple of times now. You know, you're you're doing it well. Matt Cardle, you were a complete and utter joy. So are you, thank you. No, you really are. Right, let's just give you a big whoop, because this is, if you were live, you'd be getting a big whoop at the end of it. Okay. Matt Cardle, everyone! Yay! (laughs) There we go. That's your manager and my kids for you. (laughs) He's such a decent bloke. He really is a really nice guy, Matt Cardle. So uh, wish him the very best of luck for Memphis, the musical. His reviews have been incredible. And actually, interestingly enough, on What's On Stage, he said we didn't want him to succeed at it. And he really does. He's got great comic timing and he's got a fabulous voice. We're actually going to play his single Amazing coming up after the news. And t-